Hi, my name is Amani. I'm a gospel music minister and entrepreneur. And you're watching The Other Side of Me and we are at Karen Country Lodge. I have my hidden talents. One of them is um, I love interior decor. So during my free time, I like to go and just uh, look at interior decor shops, explore and stuff like that. Uh, two, I like pranking people. So <laughs> members of my family do not take me seriously 90% of the time because they're thinking, what is she up to? My friends do. So yeah. And I like to pounce when you least expect, so yeah. Um, three, um, I love hair. So ever since I was young, I've always like been doing my hair, like sewing on a weave on and everything, braiding, trying to see what I can experiment with. So yeah. My three favorite things are food, flowers, and family. I believe that um, a woman goes through different stages in her life depending on how young and how old she is. So when I was a teenager, I think one of my biggest life lessons was um, to be my own person, to just sort of, um, there's a lot of pressure when you're a teenager to sort of fit in and act like everybody else. And one of my biggest lessons then was to just be myself and be comfortable in my own skin regardless of the insecurities I had. Um, one of them which was um, my natural lip color is slightly dark and I got that from my dad and um, in high school of course you know everybody with the lip gloss and everything so every time I wore lip gloss it looked different regardless of the color whether it's pink it's maroon and everything and I remember seeing Lauren Hill and her lips were slightly dark and I'm like wait I'm not the only one and then uh, I think there's also India Ree. There's a time I saw her without lipstick and I'm like, wow, she, she actually looks, you know, and yeah. So yeah, it was one of the lessons that I learned that it's good to accept yourself and just be confident in your own skin. And from then on, I started being a bit more confident about different aspects of myself. Um, in my 20s, I too many life lessons. <laughs> I think 20s is a roller coaster <laughs> and you just flow with it. It's so many life, oh my goodness. Shout out to all my people from Central Province. Yeah, life lessons um, in your 20s, I think for me was more on the relationship side. And um, one of my life lessons then was um, to avoid getting into unhealthy relationships and undefined relationships which I think for me used to happen even when I'm like I am not getting into an undefined relationship Pulu, you find yourself in there somehow um, that was one of the lessons I learned in my 20s um, in my 30s one of my biggest uh, life lessons is um, accepting change being open to change and embracing change my best memory was we, I come from Thika, so we leave, um, or we used to leave then, um, in quite a beautiful, now I look back, I'm like, oh, this was quite a beautiful place to live in. So we used to live in a place that was between two falls. So there was a river on this side, there's a river on this side, and both had falls. And um, yeah, we lived in the middle. And one of my favorite memories was just basically, we had no neighbors playing with my brother and my sister yeah and just exploring the place there was a little farm nearby it had blueberries raspberries you know yeah just growing and grapes so it was quite nice i earned my first shilling professionally was um on valentine's day at panafric hotel and it was one of the editions of miss kenya and yeah from a lovely man called Mr. Leaky. So yeah, if you're watching this, Leaky, yeah. How did I spend it? Um, I put it back into my music. I needed um, money for studio time. And um, I think that's the money I first paid um, Ogopa with for my first track. 
One of my best memories of breaking out as an artist was a performance I had at uh, Mamba Village in Mombasa. It was quite nice. <laughs> I liked it. For the first time, I was not a curtain raiser. Back in the day, um, I was part of a record label, Ogopa, and uh, we used to perform as a group. So I used to cross my fingers. I'm like, Lord, please, I do not want to be a curtain raiser. And yeah, I didn't curtain raise and I performed you know, somewhere in the middle there and the crowd was ripe and everything. So that was really cool. Um, another one was um, the first time I had my song on radio. Um, I remember I was in the living room and my sister was listening to the radio in the bedroom. I think it was Capital FM, it's not homework. And she called me and she's like, where are you going your song, your song, it's on radio, it's on radio. And I'm like, really? So of course I ran from the living room, went to the bedroom and cracked up the volume and I'm like, wow, it's on radio. So yeah. Um, the Amani of then and the Amani of now, um, since I got born again, I've had to go through a lot of transformation and everything. And it's really not about me transforming myself, it's about um, Christ working through me. And um, that's kind of tricky because what we learn from when we're young is do this, change this, be this. So to sort of change and let God take control, sometimes it's very hard for human beings. And especially when it comes to you as a person asking God, just come in and change everything. <laughs> you know, you find that you're okay with it initially, but, but, but don't change this too much. In fact, we can only change this much. Um, yes, well, a lot has changed in terms of uh, even the friends, you know, your likes and dislikes change. Back then, you know, it was all about kicking it and having fun and everything, but that's not who I am anymore. And the likes I had then are not the likes I have now. So that impacts on your lifestyle. Your friends affect your lifestyle. They affect your um, morals. They affect what you value and even your character. You find that if you hang around a certain group of friends, you realize that even your language will change. You speak as they speak. So. Yeah, friends is one of them that, that really changed. There are those who remained, you know, the Sun Tzu. <laughs> it's all right, we like you, whether you're Christian, non-Christian, we, we like you and you know, thank God for friends who will accept um, your choices and everything. Um, what else has changed? Oh, uh, yeah, being married changes you a lot. <laughs> changes a lot of things in your life because um, yeah you stop thinking as self and now you have to sort of include someone in all your plans in everything you do back then you know I had a lot of fun just getting up my friends would be like hey this is festival happening I'm like where is it Amsterdam the person calling me is in London so <laughs> <laughs> kind of get the drill. I'm like, so are you coming? Yeah. So are we booking tickets? Yeah. When? Wednesday. No problem. You book the tickets. You get onto a flight. You're out. You go for the festival. You know, you're not sure when you're coming back. Work is when you come back. So when I'm calling, I'm told, hey, you have a gig in two weeks. I'm like, oh, okay, fine. But I have to go back to Kenya. I was an, an Airtel brand ambassador for a period of, I think, about two years. It was great. Um, funny thing is, um, before I became the Airtel brand ambassador, I remember talking with my producer and him asking, so which brands do you think are similar to your brand and would you like to partner with and everything? And one of them we listed was Airtel. And um, we even went and spoke to them. And <laughs> the response we got away <laughs> was quite interesting. Um, yeah, you know, they then wanted somebody who had an international presence, had won an international award and everything. And back then, I didn't have, of course, an international presence. And I hadn't won any international award. So, you know, humble pie, walked out of the office with my head down. But it just took about three years for the endorsement to come through. And when they were switching from, I think it was Zane, to Airtel, that's when I came on board as an ambassador. So it was, um, yeah, it was a dream come true. And finally, you know, I remember then my producer, Francis, my executive producer, he was like, finally, finally, finally. And I'm like, yeah. And I let him handle the 
negotiations. So it was a good experience. Um, it was something, like I mentioned before, that I knew was in line with my brand. So it worked out pretty well. Got to do a collaboration with uh, some very talented and amazing artists across Africa then. And um, of course, worked with R. Kelly on a song that did pretty, pretty well. My experience with uh, doing Hands Across the World with R. Kelly was a professional experience. Um, I know music, you know, when they're doing it, like they're showing you videos of music and everything, you kind of see the studio with people kicking it. Hey, I, mean, I wonder what studio that is. Because <laughs> what I know, studio time is precious to the artist and to the producer. So it's more like you go in, do your thing, you know, it's timed. That, that is the truth. Um, but I guess for TV, it's made to look like it's kind of cool and everything. People are chilling and yeah. The reality is very, very different. And so, um, you know, going to Chicago and, you know, meeting him and the studio and everything, I knew that he had a studio called The Chocolate Factory, and that's where I expected to record, only to end up in a different studio, right in the middle of Chicago town, and everything looked so corporate, and everything had a receptionist, and had all the platinum play cards, and, um, there are placards, sorry. I saw wine for Michael Jackson, he's recorded there. Um, there was a rock group, I can't remember the name of the rock group, I need to remember. Uh, yeah, there was a rock, very famous rock group had also recorded there. So it dawned on me that the Chocolate Factory is his home studio. This is his professional studio. Things there are done very professionally. So my experience was professional. Even meeting him the first time, it was Sony office here and uh, Rockstar 4000, which was a publishing company partnering with Sony Music in America and his management. So the first meeting, of course, was professional. It was in the studio. Then we went to his place and everything. And I was like, okay, this is quite interesting. You know, you've seen it in videos and everything. You're like, ah! We're here. <laughs> it was unbelievable. But my interaction with him, um, especially now with everything that's going on around him, was professional. I didn't get a chance to sort of interact with him one on one. And even if it happened, it was, you know, I remember in the studio there were two engineers, and I ended up recording with the engineers and not R. Kelly because um, he was working with Fali then. Um, the song was in English and Fali's first language is French. So they had to change a few things. And I remember them sort of walking out and going to the lounge area and working on that as I was recording. Um, the vision of 1.8, um, one of the primary goals was to launch Airtel across Africa. And um, what they decided to do is to do an Airtel song that involved um, artists from all the countries where Airtel is at across Africa. And um, this song was to become the official call back ringtone for Airtel. And that worked out pretty cool. Of course, Rupting R. Kelly. And um, part of the proceeds was also meant to go from the, you know, revenue generated from the call back ringtones was supposed to go to um, a charity, which obviously, you know, was really good for the brand and everything, launching and all. It accomplished its purpose very well in the sense that they successfully launched in all the countries. And um, I think it's one of the highest selling ringtones across Africa. They made some pretty good cash. <laughs> we were eight of us in the project. Like I mentioned, there were record labels, publishing companies and everything in between. And. Uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah, now there you start entering into the whole corporate setting of um, of music because music is just not about talent and putting out your songs there. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. Um, my personal highlights are quite people would think you know this was the personal highlight, but my personal highlights are I'd say probably they're different from everybody what everyone else thinks. Um, one of my personal highlights, I feel like between 2006 and 2010 was like the core of my career. 
that's when things happened so first. I'd been doing music for close to about six, seven years. But between those years is when things sort of happened so fast and it was so intensive. It was, it's like I had a backlog, I had to catch up on and it was, it was so crazy. And one of my highlights was, I think when I started doing concerts out of East Africa, that was for me, I was like, oh, the dream, you know, because we were working towards that with my executive producer and he was telling me, don't think of Kenya only. You have the ability to actually go past Kenya. You can do it in Tanzania. You do it in Uganda. You can actually go and perform in West Africa and South Africa. And that opened up my mind. So when that started happening, I was like, oh my God, it's actually happening. And I was excited. So that was a highlight of my career. Um, their second highlight, of course, was winning the MTV Mama Award. The lowest moment was um, coming to the realization that this thing that I loved so much, that I was so passionate about, doesn't make me happy anymore. And it's hard for people to understand that. Because they're thinking, no, grab the microphone, sing, dance, you know, it made you happy, it should make you happier again. But no. And like I mentioned earlier, the woman you are in your teens, in, when you're in your 20s and your 30s, a very different woman. My priorities changed and um, I just wanted something else. I wanted something more and I wasn't happy. It was quite, like I say, 2006 to 2010 was intense for me. I don't remember being home for more than two weeks. I literally used to come pause for a little bit, change my suitcase, you know. I already had pre-packed um, traveling essentials so that if anyone, you know, was like, hey, I need you here, here, this and everything, I knew what to throw in the bag and get out of the door. It was that, that's how intense it was. So um, I was tired and I never allowed myself to rest, never. I used to feel like if I do it, I'll, I'll miss a beat or I'll lose the rhythm, so. It was go, go, go for me for close to about four to five years. So I became very exhausted and uh, I took a break and started reevaluating whether I'm actually happy where I'm at. And um, there was also the pressure of coming up with the second album and just come to the realization that this doesn't make me happy anymore, you know? So yeah, that was one of my low moments. Um, I think when I was going through this self-discovery journey, um, it was interesting. You know, you've been all these years, you've just been... What happened with me with music is that Amani was an image and a brand that I used to fit into. We were clear on how she dressed. We were clear on how what her personality was on stage. And yeah, it was a character that I stepped into. It was deliberate. And unfortunately, with time, even you as a person, you start getting confused. <laughs> You're like, okay, fine, yeah, oh, this is the money, yeah. And um, for example, a money was, you know, we had clearly said she's gonna be trendy, glamorous, she's gonna do this and that, and on stage, feisty, strong woman and everything. While in person, I'm that girl that just likes to wear my jeans and a nice t-shirt and maybe sneakers and I'm good. And uh, yeah. So you see, I used to switch. I'm like, okay, fine. And I'm getting into the Amani character. Yes, wear the clothes, do it and everything. And it worked because then it managed, it was good for me to separate both of them because it was my work. Yeah. And when I went through the whole self-discovery journey, I started asking myself, what do I like? What, what, what did I used to do back in the day? What do I like? And I went back to hair, you know, interior decor and I just started exploring, you know, I could just go out on a nice Saturday and go to different interior decor shops. I like the nooks and the crannies, not the, the ones that are, you know, your traditional ones. Now I, I like to discover something interesting and good. And um, yeah, I went back to hair. And funny enough, around the same period when I was sort of getting back into hair and I'm like, yeah, I like, I like this hair thing. Let's see where it will go. Maybe to be a good distraction from the music. I needed something to sort of, the best word to use <laughs> is ginger my spirits. <laughs> and hair was that. And I started selling hair. So I was still doing music. I was still going to the studio, but I was selling hair. And when I decided to get born again, 
I knew that music would not be my source of income anymore. I mean, that was pretty clear. And I asked God, I'm like, God, okay, um, how, what are we eating? <laughs> how are we paying rent? And uh, I realized that I could actually make a business out of um, the trade I was doing with hair. And around the same time, I experienced hair loss. Um, people knew me from my long mane and everything. And um, my hair was then chemicalized. So I moved from having chemicalized hair to texturized hair. And I started researching about um, you know, relaxers and the effects they have on our hair and everything. And I considered, you know, returning back to being a, a natural because that's where I started from. And I enjoyed the journey and relaxers had really, yeah, they had messed up. I had like little ball spots at the back that I used to cover up with uh, weaves and everything. And um, that never used to work because the tension from the weaves really used to, it wasn't good for my hair. And I remember my hairstylist introducing me to crochet braids that could help me sort of cover up as I'm growing my hair, because I cut it this short. No one believes, no one believes that I cut my hair back to this length just to have it grow out into, you know, natural and healthy hair. And I used a lot of protective styling during that period as I was growing up my hair and I used crochet braids and I asked myself how many more ladies out there are looking for protective styling that doesn't have too much tension on your hair and um, is similar to your natural hair texture. Because at the same time, I didn't want to wear crochet braids that look like relaxed hair. I wanted to embrace natural hair and yeah, that's when I ended up forming Diva Luxury. Um, changing from being a secular artist to a gospel artist has been interesting. I initially did not want to get back into music. Uh, I was like, ah, whew, and I prayed about it. <laughs> and I remember talking to Jesus and telling Jesus, please let it not be the same, you know, because there are things, you know, in the secular industry that I, I did not want to go through again. And I was like, Jesus, please let it not be the same. And I remember um, sort of started reading material as I was doing my Bible study and I realized that um, God placed the gift in me for a purpose. It was for his purpose initially. I might have veered off the road and done other things in the process, um, but it was for his purpose. And there's nothing more beautiful than living within his purpose. And at the end of the day, I'm accountable to God, not man. So getting back into it was like, okay, we're doing this again. <laughs> Jesus, hold my hand. <laughs> Let's do this. And it's been great. It's been so amazing. I don't feel the pressure. Back then I had so much pressure and everything. Now I'm just happy getting into the studio, singing for my Lord and just enjoying it. The pressure is not that intense and in everything. Um, and it's really about ministering. It's not really about creating hits and being the number one singer and all that. It's about ministering. I, I like the idea of an album <laughs> and I'm working towards one. When, when it will be released, I'm not so sure. I think I need to set a deadline <laughs> so that I don't drag for too long. I hope you enjoyed watching the other side of me and getting to know the other side of me. Thanks for watching.